Hi. In this second of our two-part series on autonomic conditioning, Dr. Saad Khan and I talked to Jenna Toste Mancuso, physical therapist and clinical director at the Abilities Research Center at Mount Sinai. We ask her about whether movement-based autonomic conditioning can help other forms of dysautonomia like GI issues and temperature regulation, how important it is to understand the issues around exertion for long haulers, and what kind of improvements might be expected from well-executed autonomic conditioning. The auto autonomic system dysfunction can manifest in lots of different ways, uh, and there's lots of different triggers for that. Um, you know, so for me personally, if I'm performing an activity around the house, let's say I'm hoovering or cleaning up, there's a certain amount of time where my heart rate stays normal and then suddenly it goes up. That would seem to be, and I'll start to feel weird, dizzy, palpitations, right? So that's a certain degree of movement has exceeded my ability to control the autonomic system and it's gone mad. Equally for people with POTS, standing up, uh, you know, doesn't take long at all for the autonomic system to um, malfunction. But there are other things too that cause autonomic uh, system malfunction, whether it's temperature or stress or many other things that the autonomic system has to regulate. To what degree do you see a role in reconditioning in those fields aside from just movement, which is what you work on? What, do you have a take on that? And, and where do you see movement in terms of how much can movement help in terms of those other factors of autonomic control? And, and is it possible to recondition those other sort of stimuli as well? I think that's a really terrific point and a really important point um, because I think that when we think of autonomic dysfunction, oftentimes immediately we jump to this, you know, the typical presentation of POTS or the presentation of orthostatic hypotension or orthostatic intolerance. When in reality, the symptom presentation and also the triggers can be a variety. You know, I'm, I'm here in New York City and it is very, very hot and very, very humid this time of year. And so that can often be, you know, a really tremendous trigger for folks with autonomic dysfunction. And to my point earlier, the clinical presentation of autonomic dysfunction uh, does not always have to be that classical presentation of POTS or orthostatic intolerance, right? It can be in significant GI disruption or GI symptoms. It can be in uh, inappropriate thermoregulatory balance, so excessive sweating or, or feeling chills and cold. Um, so incredibly, incredibly important point. Um, what we've seen both in the literature and in, in my practice um, is that if we start first with the idea of autonomic reconditioning through means of movement titration and movement-based interventions, um, we do see a carryover into those other areas and arenas. Um, so while we can address those primary symptoms, again, things like fatigue and orthostatic tolerance, et cetera, and, you know, logistically and logically that, that makes sense, um, kind of off on the surface level, we do see a bit of a carryover into those other systems, because if we remember at its core, autonomic reconditioning is meant to upregulate and up, up titrate the tone of the autonomic nervous system. So the balance and the, um, the ability to work in synergy of that sympathetic and parasympathetic parasympathetic branches of the nervous system. So uh, again, we do see carryover into those other areas. Um, other things that we can add in, again, from non-pharmacological conservative management-based approaches, um, there, and I've seen, again, both in the literature, but in my practice, tremendous help with things like breath work. Um, you know, I think breathing and breath work exercise is, is a window to the autonomic nervous system. We've known this for quite some time. We've implemented it not only from an autonomic reconditioning perspective, but also, you know, across the continuum of, of um, movement science, even in our elite athletes, things like that. So uh, that can be an additional measure, again, from conservative management standpoint. But um, within the scope of the autonomic reconditioning that, that I perform quite regularly, and, and uh, my patients have, have seen great carryover again in not just pure symptoms, but also the secondary. Um, when Jess put out um, on Twitter that we were going to be doing this video, uh, there was a lot of interest, but there was also some negative feedback about the whole concept of autonomic reconditioning. And I understandably, many in the chronic illness community are very wary of any mention of any sort of exertion. And um, for good reason, I guess, because of the history. Um, and then also, uh, even within that, there is this tension between the concept of radical rest, which is basically doing nothing, uh, which I guess, you know, does have its value perhaps right at the beginning or, you know, in certain phases when you're really, really quite sick. But then there's, you could argue that 
remaining active within your anaerobic threshold and not triggering uh, PESC is still resting in a way. So how would you reassure people in the community that this is actually uh, safe? I think this is such an incredible topic. And I know a thought, I feel like you and I have chatted on this topic quite a bit over the past few years. Um, and it's, it's something I'm, I'm rather passionate about um, because I, I want to start by saying, I think it's incredibly important to acknowledge um, the lived experience of patients and lived experience of those with long COVID. Um, and the reality is it can be, you know, I, I think it can be, and it has been shown to be, uh, potentially triggering the idea of physical activity. Um, and so I think the key points I like to make on this that are meant to be reassuring, but also to, to really underscore the backbone of the concept of autonomic reconditioning in that this is a symptom titrated approach, which means it is a one size, it is not a one size fits all. It is incredible, it is paramount and it's incredibly important for folks who are participating in autonomic reconditioning to understand that principles of energy conservation, principles of pacing, and again, the cornerstone of symptom titration in that we're really following symptomatology and symptom uh, tolerance, but following those key factors in order to inform intervention um, is really, really the cornerstone of, of autonomic reconditioning. And so for those who are wary of movement, I think the idea that the movement is introduced in a way that is respectful of symptoms and is at no point meant to push past symptom tolerance and, and push past points of exertion, um, I think that that really needs to be underscored. I think additionally to that, um, understanding that uh, the way that autonomic reconditioning is structured, it is meant to still be within scope of tolerance. And so if we can, we can really drive that point home, um, I, I think that really is, is the, the most key feature to, to hone in on. And what kind of improvements do you see across sort of your patient group? I mean, I don't think anyone's necessarily going to think, wow, if I just do some movements, I'm going to, you know, immediately in two weeks time, I'll be completely better and I'll be running a marathon again, right? So what kind of improvements do you see and in which sorts of symptoms do those, you know, what can people expect if they do this in the right way? Or what is the range of outcomes that you see? Yeah. So the way I explain it to patients, I don't find... Uh the road to recovery, the recovery trajectory in this case to be linear, right? So it's it's not that that line graph go, you know, go, going straight up with that progression that if you do, or the example I often use was a musculoskeletal injury, right? So it's not that someone will come and it's if you do X, Y, Z for three to six weeks, we can expect definitively this outcome. Um, what I often find is that the recovery trajectory is a bit more sinusoidal. Um, so we're seeing these ebbs and flows and symptom exacerbations. And, and what we find with autonomic reconditioning over the course of intervention is that, you know, if we think about the peaks and valleys, uh, the peaks being flare ups of symptoms, the valleys being stability of symptoms. Um, ideally, we find that we're getting less frequent flare ups and the severity of those flare ups is less and less over time until we hit a point where the symptoms have gained stability. And so that's not to say, and I always am, like to be clear, right, autonomic reconditioning is not thoroughly curative. I think that it can be something that as we're managing symptoms, it can get folks to a point where we've gained symptom stability um, and we're seeing less frequent flare-ups. And if we are seeing a flare-up, the severity of those symptom flare-ups is less and less, uh, really with the ultimate goal of, of maximizing folks day-to-day -day and allowing them to get back to day-to-day -day activities and things that are meaningful to them. Um, and so again, I think that when we're trying to imagine what does this recovery trajectory look like, that's the best visual that I can give. Um, and admittedly, that's precisely what I see in my practice. Um, I see that over time with continued progression of the autonomic reconditioning program, folks are having uh, more and more stability in their symptoms and, and we're getting really getting those symptoms under control. Well, not everybody's going to be fortunate enough to access a Jenna. <laughs> uh, or a, a therapist skilled in autonomic reconditioning. I mean, I know nodal patients are the same, but are there any practices that you might be able to recommend uh, that could be done safely at home? And how would you ensure, again, and just really honing in on this point about staying within the anaerobic threshold? 
to folks who do have access to a physical therapist or an occupational therapist or any type of, of healthcare provider or coach um, that is well informed in autonomic rehab or autonomic reconditioning, I highly advise connecting with those folks in your in your community, um, just because I do think that degree of of oversight can be helpful, but that's not to say that um, that these principles can't be implemented in day to day life. And so, I think that for an individual who is is attempting to engage in some degree of autonomic reconditioning, perhaps on their own, um, really, really important facets to understand is number one, the trend of your symptoms and the trajectory of your symptoms. So, what are your symptoms? What are things that you know to exacerbate them? Um, and just maybe over the course of say five to seven days, what what does that general symptom presentation look like, right? How frequently are your symptoms flared? Going back to that visual analog scale of the symptoms, can we rate them in severity at their best, at their worst? Um, really getting a good understanding of that RPE or rate of perceived exertion scale and trying to implement that for starters on your day-to-day -day life. So if you are ambulatory and you're walking in your home or you're walking in your community, at its lowest threshold, can you keep that activity uh, still at that light, light area of exertion um, and tolerate it well without flaring your symptoms up? So again, just starting to integrate some of those concepts, start with day-to-day -day life. Um, if one is trying to implement more of a movement-based approach, they might try to implement some of those supine or laying down-based interventions. And, and again, this idea of starting with time-based intervals, very gentle range of motion-based movements um, can be really a helpful thing. So um, I, I think that uh, with good education on things like pacing and energy conservation strategies and symptom titration, um, it can be a really, a really nice thing for folks to start to do. Hope you found that discussion enlightening. Next up on the channel, Dr. Asad Khan and I are speaking to American pulmonologist, Dr. Wes Ely, and superstar virologist, Professor Akiko Iwasaki. So stay tuned for those. Catch you next time.